Hello, everyone. So we're here today to talk to you about Configuration Manager and specifically what's new um, in Configuration Manager. Um, my name is Dune Desarmo. I'm a program manager on the SCCM product team. Um, and my name is Ahmad Haq. I'm also a program manager on the SCCM team. Excellent. And uh, we're really excited to be here. Um, Amsterdam has been awesome so far. Um, and we hope that you guys will have a great session. We've also got, we've got some swag here that's being donated by Johan in the front row. Um, these are signed uh, deployment fundamentals uh, books. We have a complex algorithm um, for who will get them that I have, not, I have not yet decided upon. So it'll be, um, it'll be predetermined uh, after, uh, after the session. No, 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 we'll, we'll give them out when we see fit. Don't be offended if you don't get one, but two lucky winners will get books. And uh, with that, let's dive right into it. Um, so when we think about working on new features for SCCM, uh, we kind of bucketize our features into a set of product themes. These kind of help keep us focused um, and help drive us as we move from one release to another. Um, and these change occasionally from release to release, but they tend to be mostly pretty static um, as our focuses have, have been the same, um, relatively the same for, uh, for a couple years now. Um, but these are our, our themes that we focus on. Um, and you'll see as we dig into each of these themes today, we're gonna show you um, a few examples of features that we're working on in each category. Um, and, um, and so the first theme that we're gonna talk about will be cloud value. So cloud value is where we talk about any piece of the console and of SCCM where we're integrating with uh, Microsoft Cloud Service. Um, and we've got some new messaging around that that we're really um, excited to talk to you guys about. Um, and then we'll talk about get current and stay current, um, meaning the whole set of features that we have that are there to help you um, keep Windows and Office up to date, um, in which we've had some exciting new developments. I'm sure that you guys have already heard some about that uh, yesterday and today before now. Um, then there is simplification. So simplification is a bucket of features where we're really just trying to make the lives of people who use SCCM day to day easier, um, make it less complex to adopt some of the cool technology that we've built in um, over the years and that might have previously had a higher bar to entry, trying to lower those bars and make it easier um, for folks to, to achieve their business goals using the product. Um, and then finally, always super important um, is the customer voice theme. This is where we leverage all those great channels that we have um, for consuming customer feedback from yourselves. And that includes, by the way, um, sessions like this where we come and, and after you come hang out with us and ask us questions. Um, it's super valuable for us and we're constantly trying to make sure that we build this kind of feedback in um, and, and show you that we care about <laughs> what it is that you care about and that we are in this together in terms of, of, of helping our uh, organizations and our end users uh, achieve more in their day-to-day -day work. Um, and so those are our themes. We're gonna dive into each of them and uh, we hope you enjoy the show. Um, so first up, configuration manager and the cloud. So there's kind of, kind of uh, three different buckets that we're gonna talk about in this category. First of all, we have customers who are on configuration manager and it's kind of on-prem only. Um, that would be customers who are perhaps running an older version of config manager that isn't on current branch. Is anybody in this bucket, don't be, don't be afraid, put your hand up. Nobody's gonna admit it or everybody's up to date. I'm gonna assume it's the latter um, and give everybody a big gold star. Oh, Mikey in the front row is on, on an older version, that's okay. Um, and so there's these customers and there are customers who are on current branch the vast majority of our customer base, as far as we know right now. Um, and current branch, if you, ever, if you hear Brad Anderson, who's our corporate vice president, you're probably familiar with him, um, talk about SCCM, he'll talk about it um, as included in the list of cloud services um, that Microsoft provides. And that's because the new uh, updates and servicing channel that SCCM leverages um, is effectively being serviced as a cloud service, right? Every time there's a new release, you know, we went from shipping every four, um, four years to every tech preview every single month. Um, and so you can imagine that the change that had to happen inside Microsoft, and I know that you've all gone through the change that was necessary in your organizations to learn how to move that fast in terms of updating configuration manager, but we also are really happy with the results that we've seen in terms of our customers keeping current. And the vast majority of our customers are running a version of SCCM that was released sometime in the past 10 months or so. Um, so that's really exciting for us to see. Um, and 
it is still, it is, that's why we kind of think of Config Man as a cloud service in, a, in and of itself, um, in that there are pieces of it that have built-in dependencies on the cloud. Um, and then there's a whole new suite of features um, that we're building that are, that involve connecting your on-premise investments in SCCM current branch um, to resources that live in the cloud. Um, and these are a whole bunch of different things. Um, Intune is certainly um, in this category. Um, and, and this has to do with how we're, we're repivoting the messaging that we've had around co-management, right? Because two years ago, we introduced co-management for the first time, and many of our customers went back from Ignite two years ago, um, and we're telling their management, well, you know, I think, I hate to say it, but I think SSEM might be going away. And there was deep, deep fear throughout the land. Um, and we at Microsoft were saying, you know what? We're, we're, that's not the message at all that we're trying to send. And in fact, we've been trying to send the same message for three years, and we just really didn't communicate it properly the first time. Um, and I think finally, finally, this year, um, at Ignite, we landed it, and customers are no longer as worried about that. Um, and we finally convinced folks that SCCM is not going away. In fact, it would make no sense for us to make it go away, um, as our monthly active user count is at about 145 million devices and still climbing on current branch, because customers are still upgrading. Not customers in the room, you guys are all on current branch, we've already established that, but other customers outside who might be running 2007 or 2012 continue to upgrade, and we continue to have our client counts climb. In fact, previously, we had had a conjecture that the number would cap around 140 million. And, and when we watch our numbers, you know, we've, we're starting to plateau, but we, we're not at a place where we thought we would be, where we, we thought we would plateau at 140 million. We're not even there yet, we're still climbing. So um, it would make no sense um, for us to shut it down. Furthermore, um, our customers have made years of investments um, and we have no interest in making our, our customers walk away from that. And so, the bridge model that we had originally pitched with co-management didn't exactly make sense because everybody said, okay, here's a bridge, there's a destination on the other side of the bridge, I should probably get across that bridge. Um, and that is not at all the message that we were trying to send. Um, the message that we're trying to send is that we're gonna continue to work on the Microsoft management platform, um, which includes Configuration Manager and Intune, um, and we are going to build features into the, into Intune and other Microsoft cloud services that you can use to add value to your existing investments in Configuration Manager where it makes sense for you. Because our customers are already with us in thinking that, that there is plenty of value to be had um, in, a, in a lightweight process for managing devices that leverages a web UI and that manages devices over the internet. Um, however, there are some trade-offs with jumping to a model that completely involves that right now, and we're well aware of those. Um, first and foremost, once again, you have this many years of investments uh, into SCCM on-premise, and sacrificing that um, is not something that our customers want to do, and they want to be able to continue their business while making things more effective and being able to benefit from the value of the cloud where it makes sense. And so that's the new messaging, um, and, and that's kind of the middle bucket here. The final bucket, of course, is that for some customers who are ready to go all cloud, um, they can certainly do that today. If you have less baggage, um, you're a smaller organization, then it, and I strongly encourage you to check out Intune for PC management today um, and then see what that looks like for you. Um, so in, in, that, in that spirit, we have a list of, of features that we support in an on-premise way in SCCM, um, and then you take those features, they're all supported, um, in, uh, when you get your, your organization to a place where you've connected SCCM to the cloud. And many of them, with the exception of OSD, um, are also supported when you move all the way over to uh, Intune management. Um, and, so this, and once again, we don't only really include Intune in our Cloud Connect story, we're also talking about things like uh, Windows Defender ATP, Desktop Analytics, um, Office 365. Um, these are all Microsoft services that, that we allow you to connect to your SCCM investments um, and add value from the cloud um, to your SCCM infrastructure. Um, and so that's the new message, um, and we hope that it resonates better. If you have questions about it or, or it doesn't resonate with you, then let us know after the show. We'd really like to talk to you. Yeah, okay, so in light of everything that Dune was talking about, we're going to begin discussing things that are new in SCCM. Is so the first thing that we're going to be talking about is conditional access. And this is something that you can get once you are co-managed in SCCM, and this is a value add. 
because we will allow you to take compliance policies from Intune uh, in addition to the compliance policies that you already have in SECM. And you can apply this to devices that are both on your network and when they are away from your network as well. So if we move forward, we can kind of begin to get this graph of what this looks like. Uh, first, the PC is managed by Config Manager, and the PC is enrolled with Intune. Here we see the Config Manager compliance settings, which all of you, I assume, already have, um, get sent to Intune. Intune evaluates the compliance. It generates a combined compliance report. So this is where you get to leverage both your Intune compliance settings as well as your SCCM compliance settings. This gets that combined report. Then we get to leverage AAD for conditional access. And we allow the device, wherever it is in the world, as long as it's connected to the internet, to either get the resources or not get the resources. And we also provide an easy remediation process. So if the if a end user does not know why they're not getting access to certain privileged materials, they can, they can go through Software Center on their device. And if there is an issue with access, it'll show right here where this, 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 oh, sorry, I can see here. Uh, this device does not comply with security policies and they can easily talk to help desk or figure out what is going wrong with their device. Right, and this is, and this is a piece of co-management that customers can leverage right out of the gate if they move the compliance workload, right? So many of the compliance settings that were used to define a state of compliance in SCCM um, are, you know, exist in a one-to-one -one way over in Intune. Um, and so moving that compliance workload um, isn't as scary as it might seem, especially with, um, with some of the stuff that, that Aman's about to show you. Um, but, uh, but also I just wanted to emphasize that this now makes it so much easier for you to leverage conditional access than um, it was possible before. If anybody tried on-premise conditional access, Access. It was a headache to set up. Um, now with co-management, it's nice and easy. Yep. <clears throat> oh, and this is also, this slide here just shows that outside of compliance, you also are able to apply configuration settings. So configuration settings that you're used to applying in SCCM, you can also incorporate into this new conditional access framework that has recently been released. I think it was 18.10. Uh, SECM that supports this. So given that everyone's on current branch, none of you will have issues using this um, conditional access. And now we go through, so we're going to talk about a few other day zero value adds for co-management. And let's get the party started. <laughs> so here we have remote actions. Remote actions are actions you can take on a device wherever it is in the world. And as you see at the top there, we have wipe, delete, sync, restart. And you know, if you were to click restart from the Intune portal, you would see the client and user device restarting. And I think it's pretty self-explanatory. We also allow admins to get notifications of their actions. So if you do remote, uh, wipe a device, you'd be able to see it in the Intune console. So you can confirm whether and if, for example, someone's PC is stolen or something and you need to make sure that you're able to wipe the device, you would be able to get those notifications inside the Intune console. Also, what, and something that we're really excited about is Strengthening the Intune console with SECM reports. So I know a lot of admins are weary of giving out console access, but because of speed issues and a few other security reasons. So we're excited to say that we are able now through the Intune portal to report a lot of SECM config, um, client health settings that previously you'd only be able to see in the SECM console. Now you can give other personas in your organization who may be interested in looking at client health access to this information without them necessarily getting access to the SECM console. Uh, da, 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 da. And this is more about the client health statuses that are available in ConfigMan and now will be available in the Intune client as well. 
What's my second configuration? Oh, yes. So another recent addition to SCCM that we're excited about is supporting multiple different uh, SCCM setups with one Intune connection. <coughs> How many people here have multiple SCCM setups, different dev, test, prod environments? Don't be shy. One person in the back. Mikey doesn't seem to have any. He's still running 2007. I'm sorry, Mikey. We got one person in the front. Okay, well, for all the other admins in the world who, who are using multiple setups, this value add, um, they'll be able to connect many of them to Intune. So if you wanted to test out maybe moving over some, for example, compliance settings or some other workloads to Intune, you would be able to see that in your dev environment or your test environment before pushing it out to prod. Oh, okay. <laughs> The next few slides, we're going to be talking about CMG, the Cloud Management Gateway. With CMG, what we're really focused on is making it easier to set up and more powerful for SCCM admins, for, Internet, for admins generally. So we'll run through a few new features that we're excited about in CMG, and hopefully you all will see the value add in those as well. So here we see the CMG Gateway. Da, 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 distribution point. Well, oh, yeah, so if you see here, one thing that a few admins had discussed with us is that they're a bit afraid of CMG because they're not sure what the costs will be. So over here we see that the running cost in Azure is about $100 per cloud DP, but we also have introduced this in SCCM where we could force the CMG to stop when a threshold is exceeded. So if any admins are concerned about potential sticker shock after going onto the cloud, we uh, provide this as a way to set a cap so that you know that you will not pay more than a certain amount after any threshold that you yourself get to set. Enhanced HTTP is a feature that yeah, okay. Enhanced HTTP is a feature that allows you to communicate securely within the SCCM console. And this, kind of, this is a prerequisite for CMG. And we know that getting, setting up a PKI infrastructure, which is what you would have had to do previously, is a bit costly. So we tried to, again, make it a bit more easy to set up CMG through enhanced HTTP and Enhanced HTTP also allows you to do a few other things like um, use the new admin service, the RESTful API that we're, we've launched and we're going to add more features for, and protect your security. So now sensitive traffic goes through SSL. So if there is any sensitive traffic that's coming from the console or to the console, if you have enhanced HTTP set up, you can be a bit more, well, you can be a lot more sure that no one else is going to be able to read it as it's encrypted. So that bucket is in there. This is in the cloud bucket because cloud management gateway is another way that we see you can add value from the cloud to your SCCM infrastructure. And it has previously been kind of a pain to set up with all these PKI certs, right? And the reason that we need to reduce the number of certs that people um, that are needed is to make it more available and accessible for more of our customers. Because hands up if you're an expert in PKI or you're very, very well versed in PKI. Yeah, me neither. Again. Only, only Mikey. Um, and that's, that's typical of folks that we work with all the time that, that work in the console. There's typically another team who you can work with who are experts in it. Um, but it doesn't, it's not a part of your day-to-day -day job, and so it makes sense that you don't need to be an expert on it. Um, and so lowering that barrier is super important to help folks leverage this. Yeah, thanks. Um, config manager for gateway traffic. And now we're going to be talking about the enhancements. So before I had mentioned how we are trying to make CMG more simple to use, now we're going to show you how we're constantly innovating on CMG to kind of, to provide more value to admins. Um, and we'll just list these all out. Oh, sorry, it'll come back, don't worry. So here are a bunch of enhancements we've done, and you can see 1806, 1802, we're actively developing CMG to make it a more powerful tool in any admin's arsenal. And if you look, I'd like to put special attention to the CMG trusted root certificate, which allows SCCM to configure its own PKI certs 
So if you were not comfortable doing that yourself, you would allow CC, um, SCCM to put a few ports on, um, to put a few certificates and listen on port 43, which I believe is a HTTPS port that you need to listen to, and device authentication for AAD, which is another one of the three certificates, the, th the triangle that you need to set up before CMG. So if you are able to enable these two features, then you, are only, you only have to enable one more certificate before you would be able to leverage CMG and all of the awesomeness that it provides you. So, oh, and this, this is something that, if you look at the very bottom there, improving cloud serviced on-prem scenarios. This is a quick example of a potential on-prem service that could be better done or improved with the cloud. So if we see here, we have a data center, we have Azure Update HQ, and in this Contoso, here we'll this. So we see HQ in the data center, the red line, the thicker the line is, is the more bandwidth you have. So given that it's a pretty thick line between HQ and the data center, this means that HQ can communicate quite quickly with the data center. The issue is a remote branch may not have the best connection to the data center. That's represented by the thin red line. So we have a cloud DP, full DP um, in the branch site. And what we see here is that sometimes for the branch site, it takes quite a while to get updated. I know a few members in the audience who have a similar setup. So we know that this is a, an issue that a lot of international organizations specifically sometimes face. Their remote branches update much slower than the ones in their home country or HQ. So in this situation, you can imagine the branch CP is going to Azure since Azure already has data centers across the world and we are very focused on providing high bandwidth no matter where you are. So in this situation, you can actually have the DPs take a lot of the settings and properties that it formally would get from the data center from Azure, from the cloud DP. So these are, again, situations where we're always thinking of ways to leverage our cloud, ways to leverage the cloud to provide a better admin experience, to make all of you in the crowd and all the admins in the world more able to get the, prepare your devices and make your whole organizations much more efficient. So if you have any other questions or if you have anything else that you would like to see, we have created aka.ms slash co-management to again represent our investment and our focus to continue to provide value to admins over the cloud. And on this website, you'll see a lot of tutorials on how to get started and a lot of slides like this to kind of demonstrate the value add that you can get from co-management today. Cool. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, Site Server HA. Um, so this, once again, you might be wondering uh, why we might have high availability um, in the cloud se uh, section here, and that's because one, uh, one potential use for Site Server high availability would be to use it as an easy way to move your on-premise infrastructure up to Azure, for example, because we support SCCM, um, of course, in IaaS in Azure. Um, so Site Server HA, um, the reason for it existing is that, well, SCCM is critical infrastructure for a lot of our customers. Um, and it's important that it maintains a certain degree of uptime to ensure that devices in your organization can stay patched and stay configured um, and stay monitored the way that you would like them to. And so in the past, this has been one of a few reasons that we even had customers who were adopting a more complex environment, perhaps standing up an SCCM hierarchy instead of just a standalone primary in environments where their clients' accounts didn't necessarily require it. Um, and so we're interested in helping our customers first maintain a high level of, uh, or excuse me, a low level of downtime um, and uh, encourage customers to have more simple environments that don't have a necessary overhead like primaries that they don't necessarily need depending on their scale. So uh, HA is a, is a solution to these problems um, and it also has some additional applications. Um, so I'll talk about the architecture a little more and then I'll talk about a couple extra ways that you can use this. 
Um, so because we have a technical crowd here, I wanted to talk a little bit about the architecture um, of how high availability for site servers works. First of all, it does require that you have a remote SQL database. Um, this should make sense, right? Because if you lose a site server that also has a co-located SQL database um, on it, then you lose both your server, your site server and your database. Um, so keeping that off of it. And then we'd also encourage you to investigate looking at using a SQL always on availability group um, to further uh, amplify the high availability of your SQL aspects specifically in your environment. Um, and then um, we also, uh, recommend and, and actually only support for high availability, uh, having a remote content library. And so there's new functionality in the console that will let you move the content library from your primary to a, a, sh a different share. And this is really easy and simple to do. There's a nice experience to do it. And it's, it, can be, it can take time depending on the size of your content library. But uh, it'll allow you to not lose your content library as well if for some reason something happens to your primary server. So you move your content library off of your off of your primary, and then you install a new site server role. We set up a new site system with prerequisites, and then you can install a new site server role in passive mode. So effectively, you go install, install site server role, and one of the new options is, act, is primary server in passive mode. And once that is installed, then all of a sudden you have an architecture where your original primary is in active mode, and you have this primary that is in passive mode as well that's not acting, but has all the necessary components in place to take over control uh, of your environment and become your primary. So now you can do one of two things. Either you can manually cause a failover by promoting the passive site server to an active state, and that will happen like this. Um, in which case, your original primary server becomes passive and your new primary is now your active primary server. Or this can happen automatically, just after just 30 minutes, if somehow your primary goes down and you're not even aware of it, then we'll automatically fail over for you after 30 minutes um, to your, uh, your passive primary server. And this, so, and this is how the whole system works. And now, you can also leverage this for a couple other scenarios that are interesting, like that didn't used to be possible, like renaming a primary, or even for some customers for, for whom an in-place upgrade of the operating system might be a four-letter word, um, though we fully support it. Um, they might be able to use high availability failover, for example, to move uh, from one operating system to another for their, their primary server. The site code is the same, um, and everything else is really kept the same. And in fact, only the, the primary site role um, and provider are moved as part of this. Well, you, you maintain a provider on your, your passive site server as well, but your other site server roles you'll need to account for separately as they're relatively easy to move around. Um, you move those separately. So for example, the service connection point, um, you would need to move after your upgrade and other co-located roles that you had on your original site server, you might also want to move those as well afterwards. And that's site server HA. And that wraps up this, this portion of our talk where we were talking about ways where you could add value from the cloud um, to SCCM. As I mentioned, oh, before I move on, that you also can use HA to move your infrastructure up to Azure. Um, and so that would involve installing a passive site on an Azure VM and then instigating a, a failover, which you can do natively in the console. So now I wanted to move on to talk about the features that we have that are focused on getting and staying current. Um, and there's a whole bunch of these, um, and we're going to start with Windows Autopilot for existing devices. So, hands up if you know what Autopilot is. We're still listening. We all have hands. Cool. Um, excellent. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about what Autopilot is, because I'm sure you are going to hear lots about it uh, yesterday. You might have even heard some today, this morning. And uh, but what I want to focus on is what Windows Autopilot for existing devices looks like, because this is a new piece of functionality. Um, now, I am going to show you the timeline of, of new stuff that's available in Autopilot in general, because there is some exciting stuff in here. But the most important piece, in my mind, um, that we, we've been missing and that I'm really excited to have in preview now is hybrid Azure AD join. Um, that's huge. I'm so excited about that. Because previously, if you, wanted to do, uh, win, if you wanted to do Windows Autopilot, you had to be okay with going to a fully cloud identity 
um, uh, solution for your devices, right? You had to go all the way over to Azure AD, which means, which meant that you had to sacrifice your group policy. Um, and that was not a trade-off that many customers were willing to make, um, and not one that would even necessarily be obvious to you when you're talking through <laughs> autopilot and how it works. Um, and so having hybrid Azure AD as an option there is going to light up uh, many, many, many more customers to be able to leverage it. And I think it's a huge change. So that, that's coming in preview. And, and if you haven't checked out autopilot already, I strongly recommend that you check it out. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other features that we've been working on as well in here that you can see, but we're going to focus on existing devices. Um, and the existing devices functionality basically lets you take a device that's either running Windows 7 or perhaps Windows 10, um, but the main use case here is for Windows 7, and that device is domain joined and managed with SCCM, and put it into a state where it enters, well, first of all, it's upgraded to Windows 10, and it is going to enter the out-of-box experience as if it was a brand new Windows 10 device. So in that way, you can get a device from SCCM managed, domain joined, over to Windows 10, out-of-box experience, and automatically join, uh, join that device to Azure AD during the out-of-box experience. So it's a pretty cool scenario. And, and, and through that process as well, uh, you can bootstrap the SCCM client using an Intune app deployment. So if you package the CCM setup.msi file as an Intune application, you can then target that to devices that go through this uh, out-of-box experience, whether they're new hardware devices or old hardware devices that you're using this new functionality for, and bootstrap a, a client registration and installation of SCCM on the internet um, using uh, Intune. So very cool scenario there. And so we already talked through this. I don't want to repeat myself. Um, but how you're going to do this is, first of all, you need a solution for moving user data. Um, so I'd encourage you to check out the OneDrive folder redirection functionality that lets you do this. Um, and so you can target that with, with group policy. There's also an SCCM uh, settings policy that you can use to do OneDrive folder redirection. And that will help you migrate some of your data um, and move those files over to the new OS, as we are effectively doing a wipe and load here. It's not an, it's not an in-place upgrade task sequence. We are going to clean the device and replace it with a new image. Um, and then we're going to generate an autopilot configuration file and, and add that file into the task sequence. And we'll upgrade that device, and that device will look brand new. And so there's a whole bunch of different steps that we have here in RTS. Um, and the, the image that you'll use image is, it mirrors the signature image um, that you would get if you were getting a new device from an OEM through Autopilot. So the principal value here is that you can have a consistent um, out-of-box experience for your Windows 10 devices, and we hope that from a documentation perspective and a support perspective, this will make your device your, your life easier in terms of what it looks like when your end users get a new Windows 10 device, whether that device is new to them or just new to the operating system. Does that make sense? One head nodding, cool, just mine. Um, and so to demonstrate this, I have a video. Before I start, I wanted to, to confirm, reaffirm that everything in the video is happening in real time. Um, and any deviations from this are purely due to your own caffeine consumption. Um, and so everything you're, you're gonna see is in real time here. Um, so what happens is that there's a task sequence that you install through uh, Software Center and you can either do this through a required deployment or an available deployment. Everything in SCCM natively is supported. Our task sequence is starting. We're going to reboot into WinPE like a traditional OSD. This is how fast your OSD is, right, Johan? Um, and um, got to get the book, by the way. Um, so we're reimaging the device here. We're applying that profile. And then when the device comes back up, instead of seeing um, the new OS, um, well, you will see a new OS, but you will see the out-of-box experience that you'd be familiar with um, from any autopilot demos that you might have seen. So I'm going to get prompted to enter my corporate credentials. And this is going to register my device with Azure AD. So previously, my device was a Windows 7 device. It didn't know anything about Azure AD. And now all of a sudden, I'm registered with it, and I could bootstrap an SCCM client um, using a target to the user account that logged in via Intune. Um, and soon, with the preview that I mentioned, you'll be able to hybrid Azure AD join that device as well. And so you can get from, from a device that was Windows 7, on-prem AD, SCCM managed, to Windows 10, hybrid Azure AD join, and 
managed by Intune, co-managed with Intune and SCCM. Um, and so that's the, the new thing that we're really, we re really think will be valuable for our customers in the scenario that we've been headed towards for a couple of years now. And we're this close once we get the hybrid Azure AD joined out of preview to, to lighting that up for everybody. So. Yeah, and it only took how many minutes was that? Like um, two minutes maybe? That was like a minute Three and minutes? 30 seconds. So record time. <laughs> Great coffee here in Amsterdam, by the way. <laughs> uh, OK, and now desktop analytics. Um, once again, not going to go into huge depth on this, because I'm sure you've heard it a million times already this week. But um, hopefully, hands up, we know what desktop analytics is. Wow. Most hands. Yep, cool. Even Mikey knows. And what desktop analytics is all about is it's kind of a, a, a spiritual successor to the, the Windows analytics solution that many of you hopefully know and love. And it has a couple key differences from that. Uh, it will support everything that is supported and, and, and fulfills some of the same scenarios. Um, and what makes it better than Windows Analytics is it will have much tighter integration with our management tool set with SCCM and Intune. That asterisk is intended to indicate that we're actually starting with SCCM on this one because um, that's where our customers are today um, for, the, for the most part for PC management. And, where, and, and as we help our customers towards the, the terrifying precipice that is January 2020, um, we wanted to give them uh, this tool uh, in their toolbox to, to help them with that goal. Um, and furthermore, to help them continue from Windows 10 update to Windows 10 update once they uh, have made that first leap um, up to Windows 10. And so this is a, a functionality that works for Windows and Office, and it's really designed, it's all pivoted around compatibility data, right? So it's trying to give you data about which, which devices and which enterprise applications are, com are uh, compatible and not compatible with a target version of Windows and or Office, um, which is, and of course, Office was not something that Windows Analytics could do. Um, so you get to view into Office assets. There's, there's deployment monitoring and diagnosis in the same way that you had um, with update compliance in, in the Windows Analytics world. Um, and there's this new concept of an intelligent pilot ring. So everybody tends to have a pilot ring that includes you know, IT, people from down the hall who you might be able to hear yelling if something goes wrong. Um, but it not, it's not necessarily representative of the real result that you're going to see in production, right? And that's what, that's what we really want to see from a good pilot, is that the result that you achieve in, in your pilot would be the same as what you would see in your production group. And in order to do that, you need to take a statistical approach and, and be sure that your pilot represents the, the diversity of hardware and software and drivers that you have in your production environment. And so desktop analytics can help you do that um, with an algorithm that will recommend a pilot based on your existing pilot as well. So you can say, here's my pilot that I've been using for, for many years, and it will tell you how many devices you should add um, to get to 100% coverage and 100% statistical redundancy as well, which is a really valuable tool. And then afterwards, it'll tell you post-upgrade health. So for each application, it can tell you whether the health of that application is improving or declining um, after an upgrade. And, and so that will help you hopefully get an idea of whether it's safe to continue a rollout of that particular software change, whether it's Windows or Office. And all of this is really, really pointed at trying to um, change the, the cadence at which our, our customers are comfortable upgrading Windows and Office, right? Because this is, you know, for the longest time, this is what we have seen our customers do, um, where there's really long, those are actually really big numbers. This is an old slide. Um, but we had seen many customers taking a long time between their upgrades, and we know with the new Windows 10 cadence that we need to help our customers go faster than that, right? And so, so the desired state is where you know, we decrease that effort graph, um, and we really decrease the amount of work that has to go into each project of upgrading uh, Windows 10 in Office. In fact, if there's no project at all, that would be even better. Um, and we want to make sure that that cadence um, is fast and that you continue to benefit from the latest features um, and, and security functionality that are, that are built into Windows. And so this is the name of the game. Um, and the tool that we've built into SCCM to help you with this is phase deployment. Now, now phase deployment is an extension to our existing deployment model and configuration manager that is designed specifically to be able to incorporate signals like desktop analytics um, and be able to leverage those um, to make a smarter deployment. What they will basically do is model the way that we see our customers deploying things today. So typically our customers will uh, will divide their organization up into groups, and they will use these groups for a few reasons. Either they're trying to reduce 
the load on their network and make sure that it doesn't get too big. Um, perhaps they are trying to do risk mitigation, right? If, they, if you're going to roll a change out, you want to be able to know that there's a set of, of devices in your organization that are safe from whatever change you are making in case something breaks. Um, and so phase deployment models itself after that kind of approach and lets you pick a set of collections and roll out that change to these collections um, through sequencing and gates. So basically, you have the sequencing is, is the collections that you provide. And we hope that the number of collections you need is relatively low because um, we're, in, in addition to kind of giving you this sequencing, um, we're, we're also going to spread out each deployment in each collection over a period of time. So instead of saying you get an available time and a deadline for these deployments, we actually let you specify a period of time over which we spread the start time of the deployment and a relative deadline that's the same for all devices in that phase, um, independently of whether they start on day zero or day n of that phase of deployment. And so what that lets you do is if you had, you know, it, many customers will have pilot is IT, then there's a, maybe app owners that own it, specific high uh, importance applications, and then app users perhaps for those same apps, um, and then a large production group that they slice up into you know, nine pieces um, because they feel like they need to for the reasons that I mentioned before. And then there's VIPs, CSO, CIO, CEO, um, in the last category. Um, and so we hope that the big groups, that, you, know, you will need to maintain some degree of sequencing to feel good about your rollout, right? It's okay to want to do your own machine first and do your CEO's machine last. Um, but that big group in the middle, you might be able to collapse into just one group if you're really trying to just spread that deployment out over time. And so phase deployment is trying to help you solve that problem and hopefully ultimately help you decrease the number of collections you need rather than increase it. Cool, the last thing I was going to talk about is uh, real-time actions. So we all know that, that uh, SMS used to stand for slow-moving software. Um, I'm here to tell you that those days are over. Um, and thankfully, we have new functionality that is deliberately uh, moving to a place where instead of a push model, or instead of a pull model, we have a push model that will help you, um, help you move through, uh, through the world in a faster way that doesn't necessarily depend on a bunch of, uh, of schedules that live on the client that are querying the server every eight hours or something like that to get changes. Um, and but it's important to keep in mind the parentheses, the parentheses I, or do I on the slide are important to remember, right? The reason that SCCM is, is so widely adopted and, and used in the world is that it scales really well. Um, and part of the reason that it scales really well is because of this, this model where devices are pulling uh, or where, where it's a pull model rather than a push model, right? And it's deliberately designed to be scalable. Um, and so there's specific things that we do want to be slow, um, and that's okay for them to be slow, like phase deployment I just, I just mentioned. We don't want to hit everybody at the same time with a Windows upgrade, for example. Um, but there are many cases in which we could go faster, and so that's why we have built a scalable model for push-style configuration changes um, and queries. Um, in our client notification channel. And so that's a little drawing of what the architecture is like. Um, and of course, the cool thing about everything that uses our client notification channel is that it will work over the internet if you set up a cloud management gateway. So important to keep in mind there. And so this was a feature that started with endpoint protection, right? We wanted a way to poke the Defender client to force a scan in a quick way. That's the kind of action you need to trigger quickly. And so we built the channel originally to accomplish this endpoint protection goal. But over time, we've added a, a bunch more features where we're, you know, you can force the download and evaluation of policy, for example. You can restart a device from here. You can um, take a whole suite of actions that are supported that are push style and will occur very quickly across devices. Um, but wait, there's more. Uh, we also introduced the run scripts feature, um, where finally you can take a piece of PowerShell and run it immediately on a set of devices. Um, very, very useful feature. Um, we, for example, a real world application of this um, that we've seen before is um, with customers who wanted to quickly evaluate whether the, um, whether the vulnerabilities for WannaCry, for example, were present. So they took those um, speculative execution PowerShell um, modules and wrap them in, in a script that kind of returned one or zero for, uh, for vulnerability, and they deployed that through SCCM to, you know, hundred, hundreds of thousands of devices um, all at once. Don't want to give away who it was. Um, and um, 
and they were very successful in determining where their, uh, their vulnerabilities were um, by using this technology. So that's just one example of how this can be used. You get nice feedback. You can visualize that feedback um, in a graph format using, uh, using this experience here. Um, so really cool feature. I encourage you to check it out. There's also CM Pivot, which is focused on queries. Um, and so this is a, a functionality that lets you query devices in real time, um, and it will query up to, I think it's something like 1,000 devices in real time. Last Ignite, it said 42. And that was an old number. It's now wrong. I got reprimanded in Orlando earlier this year for this, saying the wrong number. Um, it's much faster than that. Um, and what it will do is reach out to devices and interrogate them for specific data points that you might be interested in. Um, and it uses this Azure Log Analytics query language that some of you might be familiar with. Um, I bet you more people are in the room are experts on that than are experts on PKI. Um, and so uh, for hopefully a familiar language. And it is kind of this nice, easy user experience where you can double click on items in the left nav bar there. And then you don't even need to write the query yourself. It's pretty easy to ask questions. And then you can select items in this table and pivot across to, for example, in this bottom example here, I might look at um, a query of all devices that had a specific property in the table or additional information about that specific device. Or I might want to start a remote control session to that device. Um, and these, kind of the, these are the kind of actions that we support um, natively in CM Pivot. And so together, CM Pivot and Run Scripts are kind of the double-edged sword of the faster-moving uh, modern current branch SCCM environment where you can query data quickly with CM Pivot and make executions and, and changes using scripts um, in PowerShell. Yeah, and now we're going to be talking about Management Insights. So raise your hands if you are familiar with Management Insights in the SCCM console. Some hands. A few hands, yeah. Hopefully, by next year when we're talking about this, there'll be more hands up. Um, so Management Insights is a screen in the console that we built to kind of show you potentially more optimal things you could be doing in your environment. So for example, one or two quick examples we notice is if you have an empty collection, that is slowing down your whole environment. And generally, I've never heard of a case where an empty collection is a deliberate action or it's there for a reason. So we have empty collections and we have applications that are not deployed anywhere. So if you know, if you have such applications or if you do have empty collections, this Management Insights dashboard might be able to provide you with this information so that you can go and remediate the issue. So let's go through Access Insights, best practices. And those are two, those are just two out of uh, examples out of many, many, many rules that we've added here. The nice thing about this for us is that it's, it's actually relatively simple for us to add more of these as well. So if you have any best practices or ideas that you think we should incorporate into Management Insights rules, let us know and we'll build them in. Um, we're yeah. really, this is all about helping everyone uh, in the community, helping each other to make their lives easier and for us to be able to communicate with you when we might notice that there are easy changes you could make to your environment. Yeah, precisely. So, and we're constantly adding these. We're constantly refining the management insights. I know that we're trying to make it more useful and more powerful for the typical admin so that not everyone has to go log diving at the smallest issue. And sorry, I keep hitting this. Um, and then we can see here a few other specific to Cloud Attached. We'll, we see that there are a few rules that are available in Management Insights to help guide you through that cloud attached story that we have been discussing in the previous slides. Customer voice. So as Zoon mentioned before, a lot of the SCCM product team and SCCM in general, we are very interested in hearing what best practices are, what admins are doing, how you're doing it, and what features you like or even dislike about the console so that we can iterate and make SCCM and continue for it to be a product that hopefully many of you enjoy using and find it important in your day-to-day -day administration. So in 1806, we allowed, how many people have either sent a smile or a frown? Not very many hands. How many people are familiar with the functionality of smile slash frown? The same hands. 
<laughs> okay, hopefully more hands will go up after this. So the send a smile or send a frown is a way for you to contact the product team directly. Every single time you go, and this is throughout the console, you'll see a small smiley face that you can click. And what that does is it takes a screenshot of the console and you're allowed to put in any description that you like to kind of just mention to us what the issue is and what you're seeing on the console. So this is one of the fastest ways to immediately get visibility on any time you're on, on any issue you have in the console. So on the top right hand corner, you'll always see the smile or a frown and the suggestion actually takes you directly to user voice. So how many people here are familiar with user voice? More okay, hands. A few more hands. Um, we got Andy there who has a user voice on his shirt, so we know he's familiar. And so exactly, so this is something that came out in 1806 and we encourage everyone to use it because the more admins use this service, the better we'll be able to iterate in SECM and the better product we'll be able to make for yourselves and for all the other admins around the world. And, and if you send a frown, there's, so at work, I, I sit at a desk and there's, there's lucky, lucky me to have a desk, right? Uh, and there's uh, someone who sits right to my left, and his name is Hugo Wu, and any frowns that you send in the console literally cross his desk. Um, so we really take this seriously. Um, they are triaged actively um, and they do reach us. So I strongly encourage you to, uh, to send them if you have ideas or pain uh, in the console because we want to hear it and we want to make it better. Exactly, and I mean, without getting into specifics, there, you, there are even situations where at conferences or other sessions, admins have come to the product team and they've said, oh, I've got a small feature ad that I'd like to see in the console. And, We've, we've created those, we, we've, so we are really focused on being customer obsessed, on being admin obsessed. So this is our best attempt at being able to be reachable for everyone in the community. So absolutely feel free to send a few smiles or a few frowns. I know Hugo is ready and excited to get them. And this is the user voice that everyone is familiar with and that this is where you would be sent to if you clicked, um, I have a suggestion. And these are some numbers you see of all the ideas being submitted, approximately 10% have gone into current branch and many other are in active development. So SCCM is constantly being iterated. We're constantly trying to make the console as good of an experience as possible for all of you. So feel free to reach out to us with any suggestions and I hit the wrong button again. Um, this is the website, Software Center Improvements. This is a few other customizations we've created on Software Center where we allow you to customize with your specific company name or custom exposure of apps in the console that clients get to see. So in Software Center. Not too much approval, application approvals. Oh, yes. So application approvals, application requests. How many admins currently use the SECM uh, application request approval via email track? No hands, zero hands. Not even Mikey. Mikey not even Mikey. That's OK. <laughs> it's all right. So because of this, we're trying to make it easier for a custom app requests to be approved within the console. So if you see here, we, in the console, you are allowed to provide an email address. So if anyone in Software Center has questions about application or why they don't have access to an application, they're able to send requests via email and whoever that point person is would be able to approve or reject applications on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and it's important oh. to, so before we cut over to questions, it's important to remember that the, we, though there are no hands on the app approval front, um, remember that our console it uses, uh, sits on top of our SCCM SDK, um, and that the set of APIs that the console uses um, are also potentially available for you know, your own custom uh, implementations of things. And so in some cases, for, for anybody who might be implementing their own custom uh, app portal, though Software Center is the best and it's so pretty and it's customizable, um, 
Then uh, I would encourage you to check out the documentation um, for the SDK hooks that the application approval flow uses, because though customers might not be crazy about how our experience uh, works, I think it works for some customers, but it's pretty simple. Um, but the hooks that it uses are a set of primitives that can be really valuable if you're building your own custom portal. So strongly recommend checking that out. Um, and with that, we have time for uh, some questions. A few questions, yes. Um, and I don't think we have mics in this room, actually, so we might just get you to yell at us, and, and we'll, uh, we'll repeat the question. Um, and the first two questions will receive one of these deployment books, fresh off the press, um, from Johan. I believe this ooh, is ooh, the English I copy. Uh, I, he probably has Swedish available if you, if you need it. No, he doesn't. Maybe just Dutch, English. Maybe Sorry. Dutch. <laughs> oh, we already got it. Okay, okay, so I see Wait. two hands. Okay, I guess we both got, of them are And you can ask those questions anytime. <laughs> what was your question? Good question. Um, so the question is, I'll repeat the question. The question is um, that um, this lady had, had implemented uh, the high availability functionality. Um, and however, when she did, uh, the documentation um, I only said uh, that th th there was manual failover and that the automatic failover functionality um, was not in there. When did it come in? It's a very good question. Um, I don't have the answer off the top of my head. Um, I can follow up and, and check with you. Um, hopefully, I'm not letting some cat out of the bag and it's not, the answer is not 1902, which is coming very soon, but not right now. Um, and so I'll check for you and I will get back to you. And if he doesn't get back, then you can just send a frown and Someone will <laughs> yeah, get back. Yeah, it will reach the guy next to my desk. He'll smack me upside the head, and then I'll get you an answer. <laughs> um, Andy had a question. Are there any oh. We can give after. Keep going. OK. Are there any plans to remove uh, the SCCM reports to Power BI kind of as a licensing feature? So So the question is more about. So the question is, is it, are there any plans to to switch uh, SSCM reporting off of SSRS and over to Power BI? Um, and furthermore, will we consider including licensing um, for Power BI with SSCM? It's a great question. Um, I, I think the answer to the question, unfortunately, is we don't have a plan right now to do it. We do support Power BI reports for SSCM, of course. In fact, there's a set of canned Power BI, Power BI reports that you can download um, and leverage. Um, right now, we don't have a plan to uh, change how the licensing for that works, but uh, it is a possibility that we might consider. Um, certainly, certainly, the SSRS reports, we know that there's some work to be done there, um, and we're actually actively looking at our telemetry data that we get back on SCCM um, to figure out how we can improve those. For example, we, we might ship, I think it's like 20 or 30 reports, and we know that there are maybe eight um, that are extremely used, and there are some in there that are very, very rarely used. Yeah. And so we can use data like that to potentially remove some reports that might be bloating your system um, or improve other reports so that they're more useful for, for you guys. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that helps. OK, we Any have other? one minute and 30 seconds. Any other questions, comments? OK, well, in that case, thank you very much. Don't forget to do your evaluations. Five stars, five stars, five stars. Five stars, please.